Hello, and welcome back to Think Yourself Healthy Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Barbieri. Before we dive into this episode, I just want to remind you that if you take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram, we'll send you a 15% off discount for the eight-week Retrain Your Brain program. Just take a screenshot and tag me at Heather Barbieri RDN. Thanks for listening and let's get right to it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy. I have returning guest Guy Audishaw. Super excited to have him back on the show. We have a lot of things that we want to discuss. I'm sure we'll run out of time before we get through all of those things. But today we put together... um, a really special episode that's going to have a lot of visual cues. So for those of you that want to, you know, really dive in and follow along with the visuals to help have a better understanding of the complexity of this conversation that we are going to have, please feel free to uh, hop over to the YouTube version or video, Spotify or Rumble. Those are great options to be able to see the visuals that will be incorporated. So Guy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me back, Heather. It's going to be fun. I am excited. So when we had spoke last, you know, we kind of started to talk about integrative nutrition or integrative, my apologies, integrative medicine. Hmm. And I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding. People really just don't know what's out there, what the options are. Right now, I see a lot of people uh, running to this model, thinking that this is the savior that's going to help them. And so I invited you so that we could really have a good under, you know, a really good understanding of this particular medicine model the benefits and the barriers that are working against us. You've had an expansive uh, career dealing with this specifically. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to you and um, let you kind of introduce this to the audience. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to have one of my favorite conversations, right? So as you said, so I have a, my, my clinic Bhakti wellness center, we were a large integrative medicine clinic prior to the pandemic, and then it knocked some wind out of our sails, but we're slowly kind of growing back, uh, you know, towards our pre-pandemic, um, just the scale we were at. We had 31 mm-hmm. providers, we had MDs and NDs and DCs and uh, a whole host of uh, mental health providers, uh, massage, body work, energy medicine, coaching, hypnotherapy, you, you know, a, a very uh, broad spectrum of providers and working in a intentionally kind of integrative medicine setting. Uh, so yeah, I have 20 years of experience, you know, kind of running an integrative clinic. And then before that was at the University of Minnesota, where I was brought in as a consultant to help put one together there. And then I'm part of a, a integrative cooperative. So about 54 integrative clinics here in the Twin Cities, and then a wow. larger national one of about 250. And the the national group, we meet fairly regularly and we have some just small weekly and then our quarterly and then our annual where we all get together and, and have a, you know, a, 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 you know, a conference kind of all around this. So, so I am steeped in it, not just in my own clinic, but, but nationally, internationally, what's happening, who's, you know, who's having luck and who's mostly not having luck trying to solve mm-hmm. the problem of integrative medicine. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, uh, about 20 years ago, when I started Bhakti, it was really this question of what would an, what would a successful integrative model look like? Mm-hmm. So I mapped one out, thought, this is my best idea, put it into practice. And here we are roughly 20 years later. And I, I look at Bhakti as just kind of a big experiment in mm-hmm. what does it take to have integrative medicine work? And, and even that is challenging. Like, what does work mean, right? So those are some of the things we're going to talk about today is, is, you know, kind of what is it? Is it working? Isn't it working? Why isn't it working? What is needed mm-hmm. like that? But I thought maybe before just kind of jumping in to the integrative medicine and just talking, you know, the specifics of that uh, from a business side, practice side, from the healthcare consumer side, it would be maybe helpful 
um, and maybe mildly interesting for at least few listeners to talk about integral theory mm-hmm. and, and then having established a little bit of a, a framework of integral theory, we can take that into our conversation about integral medicine. Okay. Uh, another reason for doing this is I'm passionate about integral theory. And mm-hmm. it's one of those things that I really feel like it can really improve a person's life, like understanding this model and then applying it in your own life in any area of your life, it will make that area of your life better, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's the beauty of integral theory is it, it makes life better. And so there's value in just learning, understanding the theory just a little bit. And then there's mm-hmm. unlimited resources online. I mean, there's the integral Institute and, you know, decades of information there. And so there's no shortage of, of uh, information available to the listener who wants to go and and kind of you know dive into this at whatever level they want. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even what we take today, there will be just some solid takeaways that a person can start applying right away. Right. I love so, that. Yeah, so this, so I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to just move into um, a screen share here. So I always like to pop this map up when I do classes, and you know I've taught integral theory for years. Um, and, and the reason I put this graphic up is just it's sheer overwhelmingness, right? Is and and they packed a lot of the the models that are um knitted together to make up integral theory. They've mm-hmm. packed a lot of it into this graphic. And so this is what we're gonna kind of break down into some of its component pieces. Okay. But it, 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 this is a handy, quick reference guide available online. Anybody can go and download it. And it, and it has the key components all in one uh, graphic representation, right? So it's kind of a, a how-to once you understand the map. Um, yeah. So one of the things I like to talk about uh, is this the difference between integration and, and synthesis. Mm-hmm. Because we have a lot of synthesis happening kind of all over. But again, we're going to be talking healthcare, so we can think about the synthesis that happens within healthcare versus integration, right? And so my two analogies for this are uh, integration is like the integrated circuit board and synthesis is is like the, the cupcake, right? So what happens with the cupcake is you have all your ingredients, you have your flour and your sugar and, and everything is separate. Right. Mm-hmm. But then when you make the cupcake, you put everything together, goes through this kind of alchemical process called baking, and it comes out the other end, you have a cupcake. You can no longer get your flour and your sugar and your food coloring and whatever back again. Right. They right. They, they're they're all in this thing called a cupcake and and that's it. Right. Mm-hmm. So so and that's fine. There's absolutely you know nothing against that. I love cupcakes. They should exist. Uh, on a circuit board, the, the difference is all your components stay separate, right? At any point, if you needed to reach in and, and pull out a, a, a you know, like a, a, a RAM chip, you could, right? And you could even replace that with, with an upgraded chip and the circuit board would work better, right? You can't do right. that in cupcake. You can't say, oh, I got a little too much salt. Let me take the salt out and put a little bit of salt back in. It's like, nope, mm-hmm. too late. Right. It's yeah. all blended together. The parts have become formed a new whole, right? But the parts aren't available to you. In right. integration, the parts stay separate and and maintain their autonomy, but they interact with other parts to create something that's more than either of them could do alone. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's yeah. the key of integration, is this okay. piece of of this kind of autonomy, right? Agency in community or communion and Mm -hmm. neither is lost, right? Where in the other one, we had agency, all the ingredients, we put them together, we have communion, but now we've lost their agency. Yeah. So these are our our two models. And again, we need a world that has both. Mm -hmm. So it isn't an either or it's just when we're talking about healthcare, being able to sort the difference between a system that that or a practitioner who is practicing a synthesis of medicine versus an integral part uh, uh, form of medicine, right? And they're very different. And what mm-hmm. we mostly have out there is synthesis. Okay. And, and we'll get into kind of the, the why that happens. So next thing that's worth saying is this whole idea of integral theory 
Um, so this is the work of, of Ken Wilber from, you know, I'm going to say 25 years ago, might be a little bit more than that. Um, but, you know, he pulled together the work of, of you know, hundreds of, of researchers across time and around the world and integrated it into a, a, a coherent theory. Uh, and so it's known as kind of four quadrant theory, integral theory. Not a lot of it is necessarily um, originally uh, Ken's, but but there is definitely some uh, mm -hmm. that is is his. But his his is really an articulation of many 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 other people's uh, work. And the way we think of it is it's a lens through which to view reality, right? So it isn't even so much to say that this is how reality is. It's like no. We, no need to go to that level, right? We're just going to mm -hmm. say it's a lens that we can pick up and look at reality through. And, and that process can be helpful, but then we can put the lens down, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. one, one doesn't have to buy into four quadrant theory as, as the explanation of reality that, you know, that that's mm -hmm. there's no reason to do that. We just want to think of it as a lens that we pick up, okay. we use, and then we set aside, right? And so this is this is what we're going to talk about today is, is a lens. So just a couple of, of the main components that make up integral theory. We're going to talk about the four quadrants. That might be a, a primary focus. But then we have these other things, kind of levels, lines, stages, uh, and states, all important, uh, again, components as we put together this circuit board of integral, we need to have all of these parts to kind of make sense out of um, uh, what we're perceiving and then how we organize those perceptions into a model and interact with them. Okay. So, so from a philosophy standpoint, right, we've, we've got this, you know, kind of the traditional, the good, the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So that goes back hundreds and even thousands of years, this idea. And, and basically what, what Ken did was add a, a fourth bit to that. So we had the three, the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, but there seemed to be an important piece missing. And, and what where Ken Wilber came up with was, it was this kind of it's, the plural of the objective domain was kind of missing. And it allowed certain things to happen in the model that couldn't under the three part, right? So, so again, he just, fleshed out another piece of a of a centuries old uh, philosophy okay so what we have here and, and what, what i love about this is this is simply a linguistic model we all do this all day every day we might not know that we're doing it because nobody pointed to it but when i teach the classes and and we get to this point there's a lot of people that are just like have an aha right and so this is our <laughs> This is our natural language, right? So we have a first person, an I, and a and a second person, kind of an it, and a or a second person, a we, and a third person, an it. What was missing mm -hmm. was a was a third person plural, so an it's plural. Okay, right. So that is like my inner experience, right? That's my first person subjective internal experience. And then like you and I are having a dialogue. So the moment there's two, there's there's a we, and there's an mm -hmm. intersubjective space, right? So there's that. And then there's the object. So maybe that's my computer, your computer, we have an object. And then there's the objects, plural, which is maybe something like the internet, mm -hmm. right? right? So we have, to, we have all of these components, right? And so the, the idea of integral theory is, existence kind of is tetra emerges right reality is always emerging in in these four quadrants simultaneously one isn't more important than the other they they always they always already are right and and so at least from our perception side right and again we don't want to get into reality is like this i as a human being perceive the world through this construct Right? Mm -hmm. I make sense of it because we make sense linguistically, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking mm -hmm. is language. So we're how we perceive, how we think about the world is broken into our, you know, our four tenths in terms of language. 
right? If okay. somebody yeah. comes up with a fifth one, we'll have to make it the five quadrant model and then right. the name won't make sense anymore. Um, right. But um, so, so, so the nice thing about like being able to apply this is it, a person in any moment can just ask themselves, like, can I fill in the four quadrants of any particular experience, right? So what's the I, what's my internal uh, sense of this? What's the cultural sense or the intersubjective, right? The intersubjective implies another person, which is I know that you have an interior that ha that you have thoughts and feelings uh, that exist, right? Mm -hmm. So I have one, you have one. How those interact is the we, right? Mm -hmm. And then the it's is whatever the objective something is that we're either talking about or are in, right? There's an it. Um, right. and, and then there's the system that that it kind of unfolds or operates in, right? Mm -hmm. and so those components are always available. And to me, in, in classes, what's fascinating is we go through exercises with students of of like we take any life situation, really we put up a big board, people write out all kinds of life situations, we peg them up on the board, somebody picks one, and then we break it down and, and I have students, can you name the I, the we, the it, and the it's of that situation? And what we tend to find is people will tend towards one quadrant, right? So they're maybe a little bit more in tune with their own feelings or they're more in tune with somebody else's feelings, they're more empathetic. And then some people are a little bit more kind of like culturally sensitive, like what's the we? Um, and then some people are, you know, maybe more your kind of uh, engineer types are a little bit more about the it or the mm -hmm. system of its, right? Mm -hmm. And so we all kind of have a bias towards one or two of these quadrants. The, the, the key is how do we all become proficient in all of them, right? And that that doesn't mean that we have to live that way. It's just we have to be able to acknowledge that they exist and they have value and I ought to tend to them. Uh, and, and this becomes the basis of holistic, right? Like this is a holistic approach. We can't have a holistic approach to say healthcare if we're not filling in all four quadrants, right? And so there's so much sense. This goes to then if I'm talking about a practitioner and I wanna have a holistic practitioner, I can't have a holistic practitioner that is only occupying two of the quadrants. Right. right. And I can't put together a holistic healthcare program if I don't know what the four quadrants are and I can't articulate the aspects of my, my own wellness program that arise in each quadrant. Right. This so, is fascinating. Yeah. So, so these like making and you know doing the exercises of of kind of building this we find where our gaps are right mm -hmm. and then we just have to fill in those gaps so that we really do have a holistic approach to whatever it is we're doing right and again mm -hmm. it can be anything it can be you know um you know auto mechanic or whatever it is everything can be applied with this heuristic of the the four quadrants so up on the screen now is just you know, a detailed image that kind of lays out um, what, what, how does the, how does this theory kind of break the world up, the knowledge of the world up into these four quadrants and kind of lays out some examples um, of how that goes in each quadrant. So just helpful for, mm -hmm. for people who want to maybe go a little bit deeper to get into that level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, so then another part, we're jumping now from kind of the four quadrants into the levels okay. and so here we go into uh, what's called spiral dynamics uh, claire graves psychologist from decades ago put together this this idea of of uh, spiral dynamics in answer really to a student's question of if there's only one mind why do we have to have different kinds of psychology right if, if, and and then the, you know claire's response to that was good question and that set about his work to really articulate and make a, a model of the different forms of psychology and then breaking those into pieces said, what are the commonalities? What do these different models of psychology? And then what we find out is this applies across um, all human endeavors. Mm -hmm. and the way we can look at it is um, value sy systems, right? Like what does a person value? 
right? Now, sometimes these are thought of as kind of levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's tricky. I mean, if you put the word consciousness in quotes, then sure. Uh, But mostly you're safer if you just think of these as, as value systems, right? Okay. So we have these kind of hierarchy of values. And, and so I'll just say a little bit about what we're seeing on the screen here. So kind of more, you know, towards the, 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 the uh, lower end of the spiral, we have this idea of protection, mm-hmm. right? So protecting our resources, protecting, you know, our, our, our nuclear family, our kin, our tribe. So this kind of expanding uh, array of what I protect, but, but a person who's more at this level is kind of in the, like, it's mine, you can't have it. Mm-hmm. approach right so then then we move to control right so control gets a little bit into kind of power dynamics we have a, a, a next level up is conformity and this is often connected with truth so people again you can get into a number of things here uh, i would say we have a lot of this playing out right now in our culture right yeah. what's true what's not true you know i have my own facts you, you know i mean this this whole yes. idea, like we're really challenging this level of, as a as a culture right now and 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 spiral dynamics again it's this huge area it's fascinating it's used on a global level for looking at what's happening between countries it's used within the us um to look at what's happening within cities as neighborhoods are kind of assigned kind of a, a, a color and you see two colors growing together and we might see um, like a control and a conformity, you know, two neighborhoods that are, you know, one that is more on the control side, one more on the conformity side. And as they grow together, the place where they touch, you can predict what's going to start to happen there, what kind of problems are going to happen as these two value structures come together and play themselves out in a neighborhood, right? And again, on mm-hmm. multiple levels here, uh, this can be within an organization. This is used, you know, in terms of organizational development as well. So then next, so we have conformity, then we have kind of achievement or prosperity is kind of a value system, right? And then we get into kind of the next level is so kind of more of a learning, so a systems approach, uh, and then into experience or holistic. So. Um, these words all have are, have pretty specific definitions within this system uh, mm-hmm. to to make them kind of functional handles. Um, but what you see is basically as you move through the levels, there's a growing from an I to a we, and the next level will be more of an I, and the next level will be more of a we. So it goes between I and we, I and we, and from uh, a sphere of inclusion. From say again, like just just me, just me and my my nuclear family, you know, me and my kin, me and my tribe, and and growing. So this is the the kind of um, as we mature, as our value systems mature, they tend to have a bigger embrace, a broader perspective, and that's mm-hmm. what we see um, in these kind of levels is an increasing perspective and inclusivity of the level before it but it takes that level and, and grows it, right? That's the, okay, the yeah. process here, right? Um, so here again, kind of uh, another just kind of map showing this, breaking it down a little bit. Again, for, for folks who are going to see the video version of this, there'll be some additional information in there for you, uh, more than we need to go into today. So now moving into lines, right? So we have our levels and now our lines. So what we're showing here is kind of an emotional line, a kinesthetic line, a musical line, interpersonal line. So uh, depending on whose system you use, you know, there's anywhere from, you know, maybe six to 20 some lines of development, right? We can have a, um, you know, a moral line, a spiritual line. So these are kind of ways of being, right? In the world, right? Mm -hmm. That that ways of being and that that we can develop within that line to a greater degree, a higher degree in terms of the value structures and some lower. And so this makes people complicated because Mm -hmm. some people may have, have really, you know, worked on their emotional self and may emotionally be quite uh, mature, sophisticated, have a a broad expanse 
uh, in terms of emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. but on a kinesthetic line, you know, they might be hard pressed to take two steps without tripping because they just haven't mm -hmm. developed much of a bodily sense. Right. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so we have the, these lines of development, which are important to, to look across and to keep in mind, right. When we mm -hmm. think about applying this to, to people. So this is another model with, with more lines in it, just to show an example that we can have. Um, uh, and this, uh, you know, kind of a, a very complex image, bringing more of these pieces together to see how mm -hmm. does this map start to work for us in plotting the four quadrants with the levels, with the lines. And then this starts to look at, at, at a, a way in which a person could, and, and in my classes, we do this, we evaluate ourselves, our own subjective sense of our development down the different lines. Mm -hmm. And then we plot them on a graph like this. And then what we look for is say, you know, what are maybe some of the shorter lines, the less developed aspects of myself? And then what are the exercises I could take on to develop myself in that area so that I become a more well-balanced person across my the many ways I show up in the world um, like that. So right. um, again, another version of that same thing. This one um, is hard on the head but it's 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 pretty easy when people look at this often there's there's just they like of course it's this way uh but yet if, if you really try and explain this to people they start to get a little pushback when they start to realize the implications of this and so this is just a nested hierarchy of being right that takes us from uh, subatomic particles to atoms to molecules to organelles to cells to tissues uh to to organs to something then like a body, and then within that, to, you know, communities, you know, uh, uh, collect like families as a collection of individual bodies. And uh, so, so this system, this is again, where I, I you know, connect with uh, Michael Levin's work. He's, mm -hmm. His work maps onto this very well. And he's added a lot to this conversation of what are the politics of these different levels? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to be a cell within a tissue and how much how much autonomy is that cell giving up in order for there to be a tissue? Right. Mm -hmm. And that that same conversation goes right up to uh, people and a person within a family. Right. So if I want to be part of a family, how much autonomy do I have to give up to be part of that family? If it's a if it's a corporation and I'm an employee in a corporation, how much autonomy do I have to give up to be part of the corporation? And, and, and what, like, it's acknowledging that these trade-offs exist, right? Yeah. We all exist someplace in, in this nested hierarchy where there are things that are subordinate to us, things, people, whatever it is, but there's, mm -hmm. there's something that's subordinate to me. And then there's something above me that I'm subordinate to. Mm -hmm. And, and, and recognizing that brings about really a sense of relief when people really let it in, you know, it's just like, okay, right. right. Like I'm, I am not running the whole show. It's not all on my shoulders. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a part, which again, people can struggle with that, but there is a sense of relief when we really take that on. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about integrative medicine, there's the ways in which this go sideways like what are the pathological hierarchies that happen when a person is subject to that which is above them but but that which is above them doesn't actually have their best interest at heart right and so now yes. we're at the pathological hierarchy and and all of us could probably give many examples of being in the healthcare system where we've at least felt that right where we yeah. Where we were subject to a system that did not have our best interest at heart. Yeah. Right. This this is phenomenal. This is I highly encourage everyone to definitely watch the visual version of this. This is awesome. Um, okay, so now we're gonna take a, a bit of a jump into application. So we're moving towards our conversation here. So the preamble is almost over. Um <laughs> So here's a, a, a model that starts to, to integrate in a, in a more practical, usable way in terms of healthcare. What, what might 
integrative medicine look like? So we have this, you know, we have genes and nutrients and cells and tissues and organs and systems and a body and a mind and a spirit and community, right? So with these different kind of levels, mm -hmm. and then how do those levels match up? And and what are the things we need to, to be considering, right? And, and so this, this creates a template, again, for us checking our system of integrative medicine. Uh, I'm going to show you an, another one here that we're working on in terms of a, it's kind of an app based uh, version of this. Okay. So that we can dial in the things that would be particular to us. So me in a clinic, it might be um, uh, who are the, the practitioners on this integrative team? What are the problems that, that the particular patient is facing so we can get our conditions in there? Um, and what are the, the modalities that we're going to use to address it. So we can bring all those in and then we can look at how do all of those meet up in our four quadrants, levels, lines, stages, states, and what does, what will care look like in as each of those aspects come together? What, how do we okay. fit in the box? Right. So that's, right. that's what this particular model here is kind of giving us a thumbnail sketch of. And then here, the the kind of working diagram for the the app that would allow us to to do that thing where we can program in the specifics of any given person's healthcare system or situation, what's needed, the team, and then each of these little uh, kind of diamonds will tell us what needs to happen mm -hmm. in in order. To, to, to have a holistic uh, treatment plan for this person, we need to be able to fill in all of these boxes and know what that is and how we're going to bring that into service for that person. Okay, so, wow. Yeah, so you can see how it, it, it gets complicated and this starts to bring the problem of what, why is integrative mass medicine struggling in terms of a, as, a, as a form and, mm -hmm. and you know, this is, this is part of it. And then we're going to get into, um, you know, in more detail, the, how does this actually play out? So I'm going to stop the screen share. That was very helpful. Thank you. Glad that very helpful. came across that way. It's a lot of information. I mean, that, yeah. that a lot of information, but uh, hopefully it gives people a general kind of grounding and, and then, mm -hmm. you know, something to do in their free time. Um, All right go uh, you know, dig into all of that. And uh, it's infinitely valuable, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, it, to me, it's, it's tragic that uh, at this point in time, you know, roughly 30 years out, that uh, integral theory isn't part of our school, our educational mm -hmm. system, that it isn't just foundational. Uh, right. Because, because it's foundational, it's fundamental to how we perceive the world and how we engage the world. And all of us would be served with a better map mm -hmm. for how to navigate the world. We just, right. this, is, this is a better map than what we've inherited. Um, so, so now integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. So, so here's a, you know, an example of the problem, right? So, uh, let's we'll start with with my clinic with Bhakti. Uh, again, we have pre-pandemic we had 31 providers. So any one of our providers, we have what we call as uh, providers are um, uh, integrally informed practitioner, which okay. which means any one of our providers could be the point of triage for a patient coming in, right? So whether they're seeing the doctor or the Reiki provider, that person is integrally informed. They don't mm -hmm. presume to practice integrative medicine, right? Because in, mm -hmm. in my world, that's impossible. One person can't practice integrative medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but that person can be integrally informed. They can, you know, hear the patient history and in the back of their mind, they're like, well, uh, what can I address here? And then what other professionals address these other pieces? So what does the team look like? Mm 
Mm-hmm. And then that starts the, the process of assembling a care team around a particular patient. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, of course, so this is all kind of ideal, right? And in our clinic, you know, we would we would put together a care plan, talk with the, the person, you know, are you on board for this? They, of course, are included in it, right? So in our, in the integrative model, the, the patient isn't a passive recipient, right? Mm-hmm. They're they're an equal player in it with with a role to play and and things they need to do, have to do, can't do, all of that, just like the rest right. of us. And and that's mm-hmm. explicit. So having that conversation and then you know, the patient gets to say, you know, yes, no, uh, you know, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. Um, again, because what comes in is is personal preferences, the value systems, you know, so if you have somebody who has a particular value system that maybe isn't open to a particular modality. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it's, you know, for whatever reason, Reiki mm-hmm. is, is, you know, gets a lot of bad press with mm-hmm. certain value systems, right? So mm-hmm. certain value systems uh, have are challenged by the idea of Reiki. And so we might have a patient says, I won't do that. Right. And so that's where their value system is starting to mediate the the, the healthcare experience. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and then, you know, similarly, you, you could have, it was less so at Bhakti because the people who would sign on are the kind of people who are willing to practice integrative medicine. When I was at the University of Minnesota, this was not the case because those group of people had not come together explicitly to practice integrative medicine. So we ran into the the bias of the doctor saying, I won't work with a homeopath. I won't mm-hmm. work with an acupuncturist. Uh, and and so so then it's it's somebody on the care team that their value system isn't allowing integrative, you know, integral to happen, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're not let's say capable right. of being integral, and and so you know it takes a lot. You have to have a mm-hmm. you know a patient who is, and then a, a a team of people who are, even for the thing to have a chance to exist. The mm-hmm. people need to have the ability to embrace a broad spectrum of value systems. And most of us can't. We come with our bias, right? Right, so, right. So there's a challenge yeah. to the system. Well, yeah, it. yeah. I mean, it, it's making me think of a circum a certain circumstance that had occurred recently where I'm doing education on mental health. You know, we're going through neurotransmitter regulation, neurotransmitter production, and an individual is vegan and they don't want to eat any complete proteins. And so that is where the system right off the bat gets mm-hmm. challenged. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like... <laughs> right. So there's a there's a, a, a value system that's coming in and creating it, it, it's. It's a roadblock in a sense. A road, I mean, well, in a we sense. don't go past go. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Right. And so these become the, the kind of systemic challenges. So so that's you know one one version of it. The next is and this is a big one is cost Mm -hmm. what does it cost to have again so if i think of a care team at bhakti we might have uh, a doctor a a psychologist a nurse an acupuncturist and a reiki provider so i'm just thinking of a particular patient came in uh depression was their diagnosis and and we started of course with mental health that made the most sense but then that wasn't progressing the way you would anticipate it to. So then we brought in an MD to look at medications and then a nurse to help with that in compliance and in mm-hmm. all of those kinds of things. And then uh, a, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and then a, a, a Reiki pr- provider. And in this, in this specific case, what was fascinating to me and one of the reasons why I, I talk about it often is it was the addition of the Reiki provider that actually changed the course of this person's healing journey. Wow. Yeah. And and no fault of the other providers. They're all fantastic practitioners. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But this is this was going to be the component added to the other components that allowed this person to open up and and move forward. Mm -hmm. And and it, and I, I love the fact that it was that it was Reiki. And and mm -hmm. partly because Reiki just gets so much bad press with it with so many of the value systems, they struggle with it. Um, it often gets generally kind of snickered about my apologies to any Reiki providers who are listening. Um, it's just, it's just true. It's no different than my, my profession, right? Uh, you know, when I started as a early on as a massage therapist, you know, most people just kind of snicker about it. Right. But to see that be, the, you know, the linchpin that opened this person up and, and, and unfolded then, you know, many, many, many years of, of, of healing and transformation. And they, that person is just really flourishing right now. It's beautiful wow. to see. So, wow. so we can see the model works, but what it takes, and if, and if, if for that person, say within the healthcare system, where you've got all the costs, the inflated costs of healthcare within the system, if the healthcare system had to pay for those five providers to treat that one person, well, we already know they would say no, right? Like right. that's one of the barriers is, is insurance has said no, right. like, just don't even talk about it. That's never going to happen. Right. So, so that that's one of the big structural barriers is the cost. And it's one of the things that has made it not work. When I was at the University of Minnesota, uh, the Fairview Riverside, you know, they had a, a big grant to open an integrative clinic and they ran into every one of these barriers and ultimately, you know, burned through millions of dollars and, and, and never opened. Right. Uh, uh. <laughs> right. But I mean, it was a lesson in what not to do. Like it was instructive right. got to sit back and watch it happen and mm -hmm. be like, okay, don't do that. Don't do that. These are the problems you need to solve. And, 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 you know, one of them was simply, again, you get a room full of providers and too often it was the doctor who was like, well, I'm in charge. Right. And then the model says, well, no, you're not in charge. It's a collective you know, we're all equal partners here. And then the doctor's like, no, nah, I'm out. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going to work with Phil, you know, right. whatever anybody else around the table basically was to, from the doctor's perspective was like, no, I'm not going to work with them. Right. Well, and this is something I encountered regularly working in health care, specifically hospital, long-term care and skilled facilities where the dietitian, you know, the doctors don't want to deal with the dietitian, and typically the only time I ever heard anything from the doctor was only when the patient's blood sugars were through the roof post-op and I'm getting a phone call being asked, what are you feeding my patient? And then I would say, well, had you talked to your patient, you would find out that they actually aren't eating. And that's not the cause of the high blood sugars. It has everything to do with the pain, the lack of sleep and the stress they're under right now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so you can see how the scales, like we've hardly, we've hardly, mm -hmm. you know, laid out scenarios, but right. you can already see how the barriers scale. And, you know, on one hand, and I, I want to say, you know, from the doctor standpoint, you know, we're, we're not anti anybody and, right. you know, you know, doctors find themselves in a unique position. Part of it has to do with their license and liability mm -hmm. Uh, training, expertise. Uh, there, there's many reasons why it would make sense for a doctor to be the head of a care team, mm -hmm. just in terms of knowledge base, experience, all of that. Um, but then bring in these other pieces as well. And so so that just opens up an, another problem, which is the, the legal side, the system we've created, and the doctor who can't, or at the very least feels that they can't, and I run into this daily, is, is the doctor who might say, I 100% believe in that modality, in that I believe it's what my patient needs, but there's no way I'm writing a referral for that. Mm -hmm. It's too much of a risk. Yeah. And and that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it does. I mean, and, and so we have to allow for the fact that, that, like that's an honest disposition to arrive at, right? The doctor mm -hmm. who's invested all that they've invested to have the license they have that supports them, their their family, their lifestyle, all of that. And then they're going to put that at risk 
when, when right. that risk isn't imagined, it that yeah. there could be a real risk there. Put that doctor within a hospital system that is 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 very rigid and and has set down particular kind of best practices. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's the doctor who wants to prescribe a certain medication or not a medication, but a supplement or not a me- medication, a supplement, but a meditation practice or send them to a, a dietitian and for meditation mm-hmm. practice, but they know that they won't have a job tomorrow if they do that. So they're going to prescribe of the three things that they're allowed to prescribe. They're going to, you know, in this category, they're going to prescribe right. of those, right? Right. And the constraint of the system they're operating in. And so, you know, for me, it's really important to not try and hang this around the neck of a person, like the, as if the person is the problem, the person isn't whatever enough. Mm-hmm. It, it, again, that's why we have our four quadrants, right? That we have the I and, and the we and the it and the its. And mm-hmm. it could be a person, it could be a doctor who who holds a bias, and and that may be the barrier, but it may not be the the sub inter the inner subjective, you know, personality of the doctor. It mm-hmm. may be the system they're embedded in, or right. it might be the cultural piece. Right, there's right. a big uh, impact of culture in medicine, and and you know, the the statistics on uh, what happens with you know minorities and the 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 poor outcomes, poorer outcomes they can have for no other reason than than cultural bias within the practice of medicine. Mm-hmm. Who gets pain medication, how much pain medication prescribed by a doctor, and the mediating factor is, is just cultural bias. Yeah. Yeah. I act- actually had a conversation with a friend recently who decided that they hit a midlife crisis and wanted to grow out dreads very intelligent, educated individual and um, sliced almost an entire finger off. And Mm -hmm. so he went to the ER, was trying to get this, you know, fixed and they wrapped it. They did all the things to it. And then at the end, he said to the nurse, am I going to get any pain medication for this? And they refused and they refused based off the dreadlocks that he was wearing and just assumed that he just wanted the pain medication and he was furious. But yeah, I mean, these it's everywhere. It's a, yes. I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. This my mind is just like, oh, so many things are happening right now. But I think it's important that you have mapped it out up to this point about integrative medicine. In my opinion, I think a lot of the listeners perceive integrative medication as just a doctor who is prescribing a bunch of supplements. And that's the extent of what makes them different than going to, you know, the Western conventional type of doctors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, 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 has become synonymous. So we, you know, kind of culturally, we change the name every X years, right? So if we go back a ways, we we just had, we just had medicine. We didn't say conventional or anything because there was no presumption of anything else. Right. And then, you know, we started to grow something that, that eventually was alternative medicine. Mm-hmm. We continued on that. And then somebody decided, well, that wasn't very politically correct. We should call it complementary medicine. Mm-hmm. And, and so then we had this, the, you know, decades of the, of the hyphenated uh, alternative complementary medicine. And, and then that kind of dragged forward into the major change was integrative medicine was wh- where we were going to have kind of, you know, well, for a while we had Eastern medicine thrown in there. Um, mm-hmm. But that was the coming together where we were just going to have one uh, you know, kind of allopathic conventional medicine blended with uh, al- alternative uh, complementary Eastern medicine. And we're just going to call it integrative medicine was mm-hmm. kind of the general idea. And and then kind of coming up, uh, not exactly as a replacement, but, but really trying was functional medicine. Mm-hmm. So functional medicine trying to bring bring all of that back to the individual provider 
so mm-hmm. that, that a doctor or you, you, now you can have multiple uh, licensed healthcare providers who can have functional medicine as their title, mm-hmm. but trying to reclaim that. And then we have naturopathic doctors who who also are trying to own the domain of being an integrative medicine practitioner. But mm-hmm. if we spend any amount of time with the model, just even a little bit like we did today, we can realize immediately that a provider can't be practicing integrative medicine. Not really. I mean, they can right. try and, you know, sort of have moments of it, but it, but it really, no, it, right. we need to have these, we need to have like the circuit board. We need to have our separate pieces mm-hmm. and then those pieces come into relationship with one another to accomplish a momentary task. And then they go back to being their own separate part and then in relationship with another. And then you can imagine we do this within our brain does this computers do this where a particular part of the, the, the system, the motherboard may be interacting with a few different processes at one time mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, perfectly uh, good. But at the end of the day, that component is still that component. And, and yeah. it contributes part of its intelligence to another process. Right. That's integrative medicine. Yeah. Wow. And I'm so grateful we're having this conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yes. Seriously, I am. You know, my audience knows that I've got a lot going on. I We talked about some of the specifics of my circumstance And with, you know, everything that I've got going on, the reality is, is that I need a team. I need, I need a team of individuals supporting me. One, one aspect of it is not going to help get to the root to help start setting everything back up into a optimization process to get me back online and working as a whole right now. And that's one of the personal challenges that I'm battling is this, I'm going to have to really advocate for myself with each of these individual practitioners that I have to go and see. And then I also have to think about my values, my ethics, Mm -hmm. my, you know, my, the choices that I want to make. I was lying in bed the other night thinking, oh my gosh, I think this is, I'm going to have to go to the ER. I think my you know, gallbladder is about to burst or my liver. It felt like my rib cage was just a crowbar underneath there. And it was just being like pried apart and I could barely take breaths. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got to make some big decisions because I know the protocols in the, in the ER and I know what approach they're going to recommend I take. And I'm going to have to really be clear with myself about what my values are and what I'm willing and not willing to comply with. And so these are things like, am I willing to get a blood transfusion? I have to take into consideration some of the components around blood transfusion these days that we have to, you know, mm-hmm. think about the long term implications that could come from that. Medications, pain medication, antibiotics. With everything I've got going on with my digestive system, do I want to take a round of of antibiotics knowing that this potentially could create a lot more distress for the next six months with my microbiome? So I think that people really have to have a clear understanding of that value system when they start to go into this process so that they can better advocate for themselves and have a better understanding of that multidisciplinary approach that is necessary to treat the whole. Yes, well said. Uh, and and so you you just articulated a, a, again and no like by giving the example of of what it's like to be a patient in, mm-hmm. embedded in a system. Mm-hmm. We can we can lay our integral map on top of that and say at every decision point we have to fill in our four quadrants and we have to look yeah. at our value system and we have to look at where we are. And, and so the, the the map we looked at that had the, say like the atoms uh, to molecules, to, to uh, cells, to tissues, to organelles. So that map, so those are called holons. So holons. Okay. So we can think of like everything in existence is a holon. 
Everything mm-hmm. has something below it and something above it. We are all mm-hmm. parts in the great existence, right? So I, it's just undeniable. I mean, at this point, you know, when you were showing the graphs earlier, I'm thinking to myself, going, "Look at all these beautiful fractiles. Look at yes. how they're all connected." And I'm exactly. like, "Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. It's, it's we're, we're fractals. You know, we're an aspect within a fractal." Mm-hmm. So, the, so what you articulate, part of what, what you described there is that for you, as a Hollon, how are you in any situation going to decide where you're going to settle in the hierarchy? You're going to mm-hmm. let this healthcare provider kind of dictate to you, mm-hmm. or you're going to say no, so then you're going to kind of make them subordinate to you. In right. Way, right. In that moment, in that decision, say, well, I hear that that's what you want me to do, doc, but I'm not going to mm-hmm. I'm going to do this. And and so we're making incredibly complex decisions around these these micro dynamics as, as you are doing that as you're navigating your healthcare mm-hmm. situation, you're deciding in any moment where am I going to be the decision maker and where somebody else, like there's a, there's that dynamic right in there. Right. That changes. Uh, Another part that you spoke to, which is, you know, right now my take on integrative medicine is so part of the, the thing of, of to think about when you're talking about integrative is what is, what, whatever is being integrated, what is it being integrated into? Mm-hmm. So we use our example of the circuit board, right? So the circuit mm-hmm. board is the that which all those components are being integrated into. So in the healthcare right now, the patient is kind of that. Mm-hmm. Because, because there isn't a system, the patient has to become the nexus of integration. So mm-hmm. all of your providers, all of your whatever it is, processes, exercises, um, uh, supplements, medications, scans, blood tests, all of it, you're the point of integration of all of that. That puts a lot on the patient. Right? And we have we have don't have a choice right now because we don't have a system that we can offboard that to. We can't uh, you know right. offload that onto a system that that has an integral operating system so that I know that my doctor to the best of their ability or my physical therapist, I take the pressure off the doctor um, or my psychologist or my Qigong practitioner, that they have the capacity to locate themselves back to their ahalan Mm -hmm. and they locate themselves within the system of you Mm -hmm. to to find the right relational dynamic where we have something that's a little bit more egalitarian. Nobody's necessarily trying to, nobody has self-selected to be in charge all the time. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of what happens right now is when you have this disintegrated team, whichever provider you're seeing, well, like rightfully, they're likely the, what to say that they're they're the decider for their territory, right? So if it's right. your medical qigong provider, they're the expert in medical qigong, mm-hmm. but they're not the expert in chemotherapy. Right. They may have an opinion on it. Mm-hmm. But they they need to know where to fall on whatever opinion they might have, mm-hmm. and maybe talk with the the you know, the oncologist or open to the oncologist idea, who is the expert in that area. Right. So you have all these siloed expertise, but we need those really to have an understanding of the other's role and the other's system, because these aren't just people, they're systems of, of healthcare. What's the nature of the interaction? Is there one? Isn't there one? Where do I need to be concerned? Where is somebody just doing power dynamics over turf? versus mm-hmm. having an actual, you know, evidence-based or even clinical experience-based of, like, if you do these two things, 
that other thing is going to interfere with my thing. And I know that to be true versus I feel that it might be true. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you, again, you see the, the, again, you use the fractal, which is a great term here, how this just keeps breaking down into more areas of consideration, getting overwhelmed and not wanting to look at it doesn't make it not exist. Right. Like they are, yes. these things are playing themselves out. These are forces at play. We'll, we'll optimize the circumstance if we can have more of them in our awareness than less, right? Mm-hmm. If we can hold ourselves accountable to it and attempt to bring it into relationship with our providers to create something that looks like an integrative team. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so you and I have been talking a little bit about your health and in your program mm-hmm. and my perspective, like, is this perspective? I, I, right. I, I honor all of the people who are on your care team and what they bring. And I trust that they're professionals that are well-intentioned about your health and healing. Mm-hmm. And then something intelligent, hopefully, needs to be said about how all of these parts come together and which ones when, how much, at what time, for how long, to what degree. Right. That, that's part of what needs to get mapped out. And that's right for every person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, this is where the individual, the patient needs education mm-hmm. and needs to understand that they can, that they are an advocate for themselves and they have to empower themselves with that advocacy. Mm-hmm. And this is something that we aren't taught. You know, um, I'll I'll just share an example with the audience. So I had some issues with my health insurance lapsing and having to get the policy reinstated. So when I called my doctor's office to schedule the appointment, they said to me, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Barbieri, you're going to have to call back on the 1st of March in order for us to schedule that appointment because your policy isn't effective right now. And luckily for me, I know I know how the system works. So I said, oh, okay, well, then here's what I would like for you to do. I would like for you to put me in as a private pay circumstance for the soonest available spot you have. And then when I come in, I'll bring my insurance card and we can deal with the insurance then. Otherwise, they were not going to schedule that appointment out. And that's where frustration starts to creep in for individuals and overwhelm starts to come on because there's a sense of panic where times this is a time sensitive situation. I need to get tests. I need to have answers so I know what is next. And for a lot of people, when they're making those phone calls, they're getting frustrated, they're getting overwhelmed. And then that's when they shut down and they completely disempower themselves from continuing to be that advocate to have a role in how all of this plays out. Yes. And, and then the, the other side of that is when, when do I, as a self-empowered agent advocating for my own well-being within the system, when do I need to pull that back and defer to mm-hmm. and not just push, 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 because I right. think I know, and I'm just going to get the thing that I've decided I want or need or whatever. And and anybody who gets in my way, I'm not going to stop until I get the thing. Right. That also can be an empowered, you know, person, you know, enacting self-efficacy. Right. But 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 they're what they're missing perhaps is wisdom. Yes. Right? And and so you have somebody who's just bullheaded plowing through the system. Right. So we, so we're asking people to like to Im, to embody the capacity for both of those, and mm-hmm. then have the wisdom to know which which one should be applied when. And that's right. a big ask. It right? is. And so this mm-hmm. is so to me this is my net out of you know, 25 years of integrative medicine and Mm -hmm. why don't we have a model that is working? And this is why, and and what I've come down to, and this is my summary insight is um, people are the problem. Mm -hmm. 
bottom line is it is people. It's not the system, not anything else. It's people. Mm-hmm. And and it's it's again, we talked about that the levels and lines. Yeah. People are at different developmental stages in different lines. Mm-hmm. And we don't always have like the person that insurance phone call that you needed to make, you don't always have the person who has developed maximally in the, in the line that Mm -hmm. you need so that that person says to you, well, you know what we can do? I'm going to put you in as a cash pay. Mm -hmm. By the time the appointment comes around, your insurance will be enforced. So we'll handle it with insurance. Right. We're going to totally handle this this way. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what you'd want to have happen. Right. Is is the person knows the their role in the system, right? Completely. They know what they can and can't do and how to work. And mm-hmm. is showing up that way for every person that they need to serve. They're 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 doing that. They're they're right. Everything is guided by how do I help this person get the optimal experience and in, in Like, that's what we would want. It's just, that's Mm -hmm. not what we get. Right. And it's because there's a bigger policy at play that's restricting that individual from being able to take that approach, right? Possibly. Or because, you know, we've all probably had the experience where you call in and you get one answer, you hang up, you call right back, you get a different help person and you move forward. Same company, same policy, Good point. Yeah. Person. Yeah. And so it can like it is to say it can be both. But in 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 again, in like just to just to to own my own summary insight to argue for its its supremacy is it's back to people. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. You're right. If if the people change, the the person won't implement a broken system. Mm-hmm you know, to, to, to a great degree. I mean, there are systemic restrictions, you know, as much as I would like to like gravity not to affect me, I have not yet figured out how not to have gravity affect me. Right. So I, I am not bigger than gravity. Gravity is a bigger right. system than me. So right. you can have systems that we've built that, that do have more momentum than an individual can meaningfully impact. But typically what we need there then is not an individual to change. We need a, a, a minimum optimum number of people within that system to change. And then they mm-hmm. can change that system. And that can happen, mm-hmm. you know, essentially in, 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 in a, you know, no time. Right. right? So Will's, with Will's there. With, with where we're currently at in this crisis that we're in, yep. how can we take this model and try to move forward in a way that addresses the people problem. Yeah. Oof. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. You don't have to have an answer. I just thought well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And it's, it's, it's why I've been teaching integral theory for close to well, probably a little over 25 years is like that was my summary insight early on. And mm-hmm. so if I'm going to have any kind of a, a meaningful impact, um, it is going to be by putting in the time with, you know, a, a group of people, however many are willing to sit and listen to me, which is not very many people, uh, and 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 try and, and uh, share this model of, of integral theory and, and, and hope that more people will take a look at it, embrace it. It factored into their life to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's any number of, of versions of, of me, lots of people out there teaching integral theory or, or things like it, even if it has a different name, it's still about, uh, you know, development, like mm-hmm. all of us, all, every human being has to start at stage zero Mm-hmm. and and mature their way to whatever stage you know infinity is right so mm-hmm. we all start at zero and what we have is a culture that doesn't do a very good job of laying out a uh, a, a value systems developmental process mm-hmm. don't have a a culture that 
has put in place something that will move people from birth zero to again optimum within a lifetime right like what's the maximum the average number of people could reach in terms of their value systems development across a life course we haven't optimized a culture that does that Mm -hmm. than the opposite yeah right yeah yeah kind of laid out like what three you're you're a adolescent you're an adult you're retired Mm -hmm. and there's kind of cultural expectations for what you'll do in those three areas that we've set out and that's about it and 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 even then it's kind of like good luck we're going to help you out a bit in the beginning here we're going to help you go to school and get a bit of an education and then after that you're on your own right And, and so uh we could do better for sure yeah um, yeah. So one of the things that you and I had talked about in the last interview um, was, you know, really to the point of education. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, we have to do a better job of having conversations like this, sharing mm-hmm. perspectives so that people can consider how does that fit into their value system, knowing whether or not they could take a direction or not take a direction. So how could we elaborate on this? How can we do a better job at helping to educate the masses to start considering different perspectives and then how that might associate to their value system? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a sense that that that's, that's what you're doing, right? Certainly when you're on air, right? That's yeah. That's what you're doing. You're bringing multiple diverse perspectives and, and giving people an opportunity to be exposed to a perspective other than theirs. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the, that's in many ways, that's the process. Like that's what it takes is people willing. I mean, people need to still be willing to listen. They have to go seek mm-hmm. it, find it, be willing to take it in. And then when they find something that challenges them, they have to be willing to stay with that and, mm-hmm. and, and work out that friction versus turn it off and go like, I don't want to listen to that because that isn't supporting my already on board bias, which we talk about this a lot in our society right now with our bubbles and how how people can get siloed in their bubble and never hear uh, another perspective that, that creates any like smallest amount of irritation in their mm-hmm. nervous system so that they can stay comfortably wrapped, you know, in their little, uh, what kind of fleece bubble of myopic uh, perspective. Right. And, right. and was, so we, we built a culture that supports that the antidote is the antidote. The antidote is long form podcasts that expose people to something that is challenging enough to to get them to move towards growth, right? Move mm-hmm. a few steps because we have to be have to acknowledge, and then this is what the, the integral theory has the spiral. Mm-hmm. You you have to cover all of the developmental ground of the spiral. You can't just jump up two levels, right? Yeah, you, you can't do it. Not you can't live it. You can visit another level momentarily, have an insight. Mm-hmm. Meditation, psychedelics, dreaming can give us mm-hmm. insights into another perspective, but we can't live those perspectives without building the internal infrastructure. So we call it, you know, insight, realization, actualization. That's mm-hmm. a process. So people need to encounter things that are that are just outside of their current level of growth enough that it pulls them forward. And then you have mm-hmm. to do that every day for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, I think that this is where visuals can be really impactful with helping to connect with individuals to pique that interest, to get them to kind of stay with you for what, that 30 second time span that we have with someone's <laughs> attention span nowadays, uh, you know, but ultimately, you know, as a society, we're not taught to discern information. We are really just uh, 
these sponges that are walking around absorbing, absorbing, and just accepting everything that we're hearing and seeing as truth. And we're not taught to do that critical thinking and more of that challenge. And, you know, for me, I became a registered dietitian because I was diagnosed with a, uh, you know, a critically complicated uh, kidney disease that had some really non-favorable prognosis that got me using my value system of I want to live. So I'm going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I became a dietitian, started working clinically, doing diabetes, cardiovascular education, thinking that I'm going to change these people's lives. And then week after week, they come back, they're not making any change. And so it got me thinking, number one, I did not go into all this debt to be so miserable. And number two, this isn't about lack of education. There's barriers. There's all these barriers that are standing in the way that are keeping people from being able to take that consistent action. And that's when I sought out my master's and, you know, I got my master's in multidisciplinary health communication, specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy, because I under, I, I had this inclination that this whole systems idea is where we're being caught up. That's keeping us from being able to have the outcomes and, and achievements that we desire. So, <sighs> so, so again, I'm going to take it back to it's people. Yeah. Yeah. It's people. And yeah, you, it is. You, you said it right there just a moment ago. I mean, I sit in front of people and on a daily basis, I do a lot of work in the dementia space, but it mm-hmm. could be anything. But but it's remarkable to me where I'll be talking with somebody who maybe has a new diagnosis of, of dementia. So they mm-hmm. know that they're on a downward trajectory really without any anticipation of a medical intervention because mm-hmm. allopathic medicine has nothing meaningful to offer these people. Right. So it's it's that, that here's this, this terrible, devastating diagnosis. And, and then, you know, somehow they end up talking with me and I say, well, actually, you know, there, there is reason for hope here. We Uh have interventions that can be quite effective, right? The research Uh shows about an 85% efficacy rate. Like that's a high, like if you could go to Vegas with an 85% chance you were going to win, like yeah, that wouldn't be gambling <laughs> anymore. That would just right. be game, right? Right. So, so yeah, you just want to be one of the first people there before Vegas runs out of money. Um, right. But 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 I've talked to people and I say, well, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to you know have these devices and you're going to have to put them on and you're going to have to do this you know 30 minutes twice a day. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't do that. Well, could you do 30 minutes once a day? No. And, 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 and like, that's it. Like, that's the moment, like right there. It's like, wow, wow. You won't spend 30 minutes a day basically doing nothing, right? Cause you just put them on and lay there. So it's not like I'm asking people to go out and, you know, do something right. Herculean. It's like, just lay there. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so, so- I'm really surprised by the number of people who just won't do anything to help themselves. And, right. and again, in terms of healthcare, it's like, that's not the system. Mm-hmm. You know, is- it's the person, but I'm wondering, is there a better way we can convey the value to them to help them have a better understanding of why the time commitment is necessary? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here you could, there's a number of ways we could look at this, but first thing that comes to mind is is the whole role, you know, over the last few decades emerging of the coach. Mm-hmm. Right? And so the role of the coach is motivation. H- how do you get a person to do the thing they already know to do that they're supposed to do? They've got all everything, but mm-hmm. they just won't do it mm-hmm. and or won't do it consistently. But the role of the coach is to hopefully remove these final barriers, which are the barriers to action. Mm-hmm. And so there's a, you know, there's a whole area there. Again, our fractal breaks open again for mm-hmm. this person of what's going on for them psychologically, emotionally, that that they they won't do the thing that will help them. Mm-hmm. And, and and 
yeah, there's a, again there's a lot to be said just in that domain, especially if we're talking about uh, dementia, because now the organ that mm-hmm. is needed to do the executive function is the organ that is is compromised, mm-hmm. and, and and so that's challenging for people to make right. high level decisions when the thing that you make them with is the thing that's that's struggling. So we have multiple layers here. But nevertheless, it's a common problem across medicine, hence coaching, mm-hmm. you know, emerging as a as a as an as an essential healthcare mm, resource. Yeah. Because compliance, I don't know the statistics on that. I probably should. Um, I'll talk with Google later. But it's <laughs> got to be one of the main uh contributing factors to poor outcomes mm-hmm. is just patient compliance. Like every provider and, knows compliance is at the end of the day is probably the biggest problem. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's funny that you say that because you made me just think of a situation, but right now part of my compliance, I have to give credit to my husband because he's texting me. Did you did did you do your did you do your light therapy yet? Have you done your CV CES, your A V A you know what I'm trying to say? I do. But but ultimately yeah. yep. he's on my ass right now, making sure that I do all of these things because he wants his life back. He wants us to be able to travel and to be able to fix real meals and all of the things. So he is an essential component to my compliance right now. So this is where the support system really does come into play. And we have to drop out the ego and try to go at this all alone and say to ourselves, where are there potential areas of support that I can engage in and allow myself to receive in order to have the compliance, which is going to speed up the outcome results, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, way to go, husband. Yeah. That's what we need. A cheerleader. I I have a funny story. He (laughs) found a chocolate wrapper in the bedroom. Okay. And I'm out running an errand and I get a text message with this chocolate wrapper. And he's like, are you effing kidding me? Like really Heather? And all I started, all I could do was laugh, but then it pissed me off because like, how dare you insinuate? It wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. But he, in that moment, you know, he was looking for something to attach to, to attack me. With. It was a really, it was a very comical um, circumstance that played out. Needless to say, we took a little break from each other until we were able to like calm down and then come back together and have a civil conversation about, you know, but the bottom line is we were both at a very frustrated point and the rapper just happened to be the dynamite that lit, you know, the fuse that lit the dynamite. <laughs> yes. And and this this is why this whole problem is complicated. It's people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if for- you systemize it, it would be we would be fine. Like when AI takes over, we'll be fine. <laughs> In some ways. <laughs> so for the listener listening, who's like, okay, well, I am people and I am willing to play my role to, to you know, to do a better part at helping to serve the system. What are some simple tips that you can give that individual to get started? Sure. So I think a person could go and we have the internet, all of this stuff is abundantly available. Uh, go in and look at spiral dynamics. So it's it's a complete system within itself. It's been integrated into integral theory, but it's a complete system standalone on itself and, and can be fairly agnostic. It, it does not have to be spiritual or religious or belong to any camp of psychology or or anything. You can just take it on as a series of, of propositions. It's a, it's okay. as nice from that sense that it, okay. it can be kind of clear and, and, and not trigger people's various biases. Um, mm-hmm. But so something like spiral dynamics, and there are other systems like it, many have developed since spiral dynamics, and there was plenty before that. 
but they've done a good job of of really building this out and making it functional for a modern Western life for a person to be able to embrace this, open up the book, start reading about it and 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 begin applying it the next day. I mean, it really is. So it's a great place to go. Um, then if a person wants a little bit more complicated, they could go to integral theory, similar. There's a ton of information. You can get workbooks and, and online courses. And I'm sure somebody still has CDs that they would send you, but who has a CD player anymore? But, uh, you know, you could find these resources abundantly available and begin to, to understand the operating system, right? We call it the integral operating system. And get that in your mind and start applying it. And like literally, it's a thing that can start creating change in in hours and days, mm-hmm. not months and years, but hours yeah. and days. And and it's a deep well that a person can go to to get more and more of of that. And so that you know, it's it's that easy, really. Just, mm-hmm. just yeah, spiraling so if- real theory. I love it. So I'm really, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of listeners right now who are glad that they tuned in and stayed with us for this conversation, because I think that this really just brings a more expanded um, perspective to what the possibilities of this model is, you know, what, what all the dynamics are that make it up. It's not just taking supplements, unfortunately, like a lot of people think, Um I know that for myself, this has been an extremely valuable conversation and definitely makes me have to think about where my own personal biases are and how those are potentially working against me as I continue to navigate forward with my own journey and trying to get the answers and come up with the solutions to get me back to my whole self. So I can't thank you enough for your time. And if someone in the audience is listening and would like to connect with you, where can they go to do that? Sure. So probably the easiest is to cerebralfit.com. So cerebralfit.com. It's actually the, the website for our brain health company, but but I have a bookable schedule on there if somebody wants to schedule a consult and just find out some more. Might integrative medicine be right for them and what resources are available? Uh, they can just schedule a consult online at cerebralfit.com and, and I- take it from there. I highly encourage anyone listening who is interested to take advantage of that offer. I know you have been such a vital component to helping me figure out a lot of pieces in the journey that I've been battling with over the last 18 months. And so there's not a person out there who would not benefit from having a conversation and just your perspective and guidance to help get them and on some track to start pursuing. Um, It's definitely... It's priceless, literally priceless. Well, Guy, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to pull up the graphics, walk us through this entire process so that we can have a better understanding and also understand how we play a role in this bigger picture and where we have personal responsibility for ourselves. There is no magic pill. There is no savior that's going to come down and, and, you know, (laughs) make it all work we have to take action. So thank you for, for the reassurance and and the further explanation. Thank you, Heather. It's been a delight. Let's do it again. Uh, soon. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the think yourself healthy podcast. Do me a favor. And if you loved this episode, please go leave a review. Reviews help make sure that this content reaches more people so that we can continue to heal as a collective. Remember to take a screenshot that you're listening and tag us on Instagram at Heather Barbieri RDN for a 15% discount on the Retrain Your Brain program. See you next time.